Welcome to this episode of the Austin Forum Upload. I'm Jay Boisseau, the Executive Director and Founder of the Austin Forum on Technology and Society. And I'm very pleased to have with us today for the topic of misinformation, disinformation, and malignant information, as you'll soon hear, Robert Matney, the Director of Partnerships for Primer AI. Robert, thanks for joining us. So glad to be here, Jay. Thanks for having me on. Robert, this is a topic that I don't profess to have any expertise in, but I'm quite convinced it's one of the most serious problems facing society because we have lots of divides and opinions and extreme positions. And I know that misinformation and disinformation are weighing into that. Before we jump into it, can, can you share your definitions of the terms that we're going to talk about today? Sure, absolutely. I, some of the terms we'll talk about today uh, are misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. Uh, and these have stabilized around fairly consistent definitions now. Um, and those are misinformation being information that has factual errors within it uh, that is being spread and typically without awareness of their lack of factual value. So that's misinformation. Whereas disinformation is information uh, with that is a far from factual accuracy that is also being spread for malignant intent. It is being spread, inaccurate information is being spread to affect a specific outcome. And then there is a newer term within this, which is referred to as malinformation. And that is information that is either broadly or completely true, which is being spread with malignant intent. So uh, a kind of easy ringer of an example of that might be doxing someone, right? Spreading the information of someone's address or personal information with an intent to, intent to cause them harm uh, or discomfort or inconvenience of some flavor. Um, and so miss, dis, mal sometimes gets concatenated into MDM, and we kind of refer to it as a complete set. And I think it makes sense to think about them as a unit, uh, in part because um, it, they, they all operate under the same functions. And in particular, um, disinformation and malinformation are really subspecies of marketing campaigns, right? These are efforts to persuade people to take on a position, um, typically covertly, uh, typically with some sort of antagonistic objective in mind. And I just want to make sure for our readers we're clear, when you say some kind of marketing campaign, the term they probably would hear and the usage of disinformation is more of a propaganda type of marketing campaign, right? I think that's exactly right. Uh, I, you know, pro propaganda is marketing in the marketplace of ideas, yes. right? And so, um, and, and indeed, sometimes the marketplace of ideas has with it significant profit motives. So sometimes it's the marketplace of the market as oh. well as the marketplace of ideas. Uh, and yes, I think propaganda is the right way to think about it in part because it anchors us into the history uh, of this landscape that certainly is transformed, but, but it reminds us to remember that this component isn't new under the sun. <laughs> this component has been with us for a long time. Uh, that's a great point. And some of the Austin Forum's previous discussions and events in which this was either the primary or at least a secondary topic, we remind everybody that just because you're hearing about misinformation and disinformation more now, doesn't mean it hasn't always been there as long as there's been people with different opinions and the ability to communicate. There have always been uh, uh, error-prone communications and, and worse, intentionally false communications to try to achieve some end goal. For, for sure. Absolutely. And there's been in intentionally accurate information uh, spread in order to achieve some goal. Uh, and, and oftentimes, whether that goal is um, uh, benign or malignant it is kind of in the eye of the beholder, right? And, and so it would be easy to think about 
uh, an old school propaganda effort of of um, you know dropping pamphlets about the the um, glories of democracy in an environment where maybe democracy wasn't flourishing. Well, from the perspective of those like myself who champion the values of Western liberal democracy, uh, th that certainly wouldn't be malignant. But in the eyes of folks who were committed to a different world order and a different worldview, that would be uh, malignant, and and from that perspective, be reasonably called information. And, and I would just add that early on in uh, discussion about disinformation, when that word started getting common use in uh, in, Amer in English and in, in, in America, um, it was oftentimes referred to as computational disinformation to really distinguish that the, the difference of doing this online uh, is so significant that it becomes its own species, but it's rooted in what came before. Yeah, and we're going to talk about the technologies that have enabled the more rapid and effective spread of uh, disinformation and malinformation coming up. But I, I, especially for disinformation and malinformation, how much of this, how much of the problem is a domestic problem versus how much of it is uh, disinformation and malinformation is driven by international conflict? Yeah, uh, so it's a global problem, and I think it has been easy to think of it as exclusively a foreign problem or a problem that's being perpetrated by foreign propaganda networks, and it is. It, it, absolutely, that is happening, um, and, and it has happened for a while, and it continues to happen at significant volume. Um, and also, it, it happens globally, it happens domestically, and also the internet is always global. So the origin and source of it, it is less important in many contexts uh, than than the other contours of it. Um, but for sure, there's I mean, there's a kind of species of denialism that says, hey, listen, there is no coordinated um, uh, foreign interference. And that's absolutely wrong. We have uh, very good reason to think that, um, uh, for example, China has invested uh, something like $24 billion into its influence operations budget, Russia a few billion, um, and there's other um, international participants in this as well. And also, we must never let ourselves off the hook and think that uh, uh, that this doesn't happen in a civilian and domestic context as well. You just used a term that I had not heard before, influence operations. So is that typically a nation that uh, conducts a campaign of influence operations? Is it is the term usually used in the context you just used it with China? Or do companies engage in influence operations? And is that just, in that case, is it just a fancy word for marketing? Yeah, I mean... It is most common, that phrase is most commonly used in the context of nation state competition uh, mm -hmm. and adversarial relationships. Um, and yet it does remain a, a fancy word for marketing, um, for sure. And in our pre-talk notes, you talked about cognitive warfare. Can you describe that? Uh, again, something that isn't new, that has always been there. Um, you know, humans wage um, competition uh, ranging all the way to warfare, right? So you can think of it as a, a spectrum where you have allies and partners, and then you have competitors, and then you have maybe adversaries to enemies or something. You know, there, there's a, a kind of continuum of this. And, and when we're conducting things to the right of competition, um, uh, humans have always operated in multiple domains. And one of the domains we operate in is information. So in the information domain, uh, we might think of propaganda as the, the tool, right? When we're in a competitive, a, a state of competition with another nation state. None of that is, is new, of course. Um, and uh, Sometimes the phrase information warfare is used in that context, sometimes cognitive warfare, because the idea is, well, information doesn't do anything 
on its own, it's human cognition right. yeah. really at stake, right? So I think the goal by using cognitive warfare rather than information is to humanize it and make sure that we remember that it's about winning the hearts and minds of humans in that context. Great explanation. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the technologies that enable not just misinformation, but disinformation and malinformation and malignant information. Talk about a little bit about how smartphones and social media and the web have amplified people's ability to create this kind of malignant information. Yeah, I mean, for a long time, um, the goal, the gold standard was creating frictionless software, right? That would make it as easy as possible to weigh in on a topic without um, asking deep thought of us at all, right? And, and so frictionless software is something that um, all software developers have pursued. And there was there there was and there remains a kind of techno utopian commitment that um, by putting a, a printing press in everyone's pocket and making it exceedingly easy to communicate ideas, that there was only upside to be found. And and I I would posit that through a failure of ethical imagination, we we failed to think about the plausible downsides uh, of what that would engender. And so, you know, when when we talk about the technologies that have facilitated it, broadly speaking, the answer is the platforms, right? The platforms by making it super easy to spread ideas and, and by not um, in their ambition, I think probably mostly sincere ambition to create a marketplace of ideas that's unfettered, where the best ideas win, where growing enfranchisement and demo democratic access to technology was growing. I mean, I think all of these were real. They were certainly real for me personally, and I know I'm not alone. I, and I tend to take the platform's founders at their word as sincere, that they also thought this would be um, uh, the, the outcome. B but the truth is that it also made a system that was very easy to manipulate. And, and that's the difficulty. And so it's the platforms as they live on your phone, in your pocket at all times. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm with you. I, I believe that social media has many good points, uh, purposes and results. And, you know, it's, I certainly keep in touch with people around the world in a way that I could never make time for individual contact with all of them, but we're part of the same social, let's call it social networks in that sense. I'm a very big fan of the social network aspect of being able to communicate with your with your network. Um, social media, of course, is the term everybody uses for it now, and people are using it to spread news, which is sometimes not correct. Uh, I, I do like you take the founders at their um, face value when they say what their intent was, but it, it does seem that the incentives are not lined up well for them to stick to their principles on that. They may have had founding principles, but they're essentially almost all of them are advertising revenue generated and views and clicks are money, right? And it turns out sometimes extreme points of view get an amplified number of clicks. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. There's all manner of industries where um, where there's perverse incentives in some direction that causes, you know, human or, you know, ecological harm or, or, or whatever. And in those cases, we need solutions that are more comprehensive than, than just uh, those incentives to, to guide. And we don't really have those yet. And I think that, um, you know, for example, the evaluation, the core metric of a platform being a monthly active user um, is really quite telling because if a monthly active user is all that you need to create in order to build brand equity, raise a great next round, uh, achieve a, a startling and beneficial IPO, um, and then to serve your stakeholders to whom you now have a fiduciary duty after an IPO, right? Um, a monthly active user uh, account does not relate back to a human, right, uh, necessarily. And, and so creating a layer that might force that or um, 
reducing activity because that activity is demonstrably harmful because it has credible threats of violence or whatever. Any of these kinds of moderating tactics that one might do in order to keep a healthy environment is likely to have the outcome of driving down the MAU, which would put you on the hook for betraying your stockholders to whom you have a fiduciary duty to build value, for example. So the single-minded fixation on the MAU is a challenge in the ecosystem that humanity now needs to wrestle with. All right. So we've defined disinformation and malinformation. We've defined influence operations and how it's a persistent effort in in those directions to create that kind of mindset, that cognitive warfare kind of thing. You had a a great sentence in our pre-call notes, and I've never before in a podcast done this, but I want to read the sentence that you sent about something you wanted to talk about because there's so much information in this sentence. You said, effective influence operations relies on information laundering through networks of web domains and social properties that supply plausible deniability and cover more ideological ground by appearing as if organically from a wide array of sources with which different readers will relate to and trust. It's a long sentence, but you really pack a lot into that sentence. Can you can you build on that and pick it apart a little bit so our readers understand the different aspects of that sentence? Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I mean, this is really applicable to sophisticated disinformation campaigns uh, and sophisticated apparatuses of influence operations. And, and so w- w- among the things that will happen is that there, there will be, um, for example, a set of domains that have been set up, um, potentially even appearing from opposing positions. Um, and they will all source their information from some centralized source. So in the case of state control, um, you know, there might be uh, uh, an, an agency or an entity of the government. Maybe it's run by an oligarch who is faithful to the, the particular president of that country. Um, and they're going to create a distributed network that doesn't appear to have any relationship to itself, but they're all going to agree on what the talking points are. They're going to start to agree. Maybe there's multiple sets of talking points. Maybe there's even talking points that disagree with each other, but keeping the model simple, let's say they're all taking up the same talking point. And by feeding that in, but using different language from a bunch of different sources, then not only do you expose to the readers of each of those kind of satellite entities, as it were, it's the case that more overtly controlled, like state controlled media entities can report on the news that people are saying, right? And and in doing that, you can kind of launder the news up the chain of credibility until you get to something that is a kind of well-established news media outlet Um, uh, And that can also happen in ways that aren't directly under state control. So if you want to propagate a narrative, you might propagate it over here, and eventually it may percolate on up and get percolate on up until it gets reported on by major publications of record, because now the news is news itself. The idea has become news itself, or it's just become so persuasive because so many people now believe it because they've seen it so many times from so many different places, that now it becomes part of their own intellectual furniture. Uh, Great point. Thank you for expanding that because it, it, it's been a, a source of concern for me for a while that there are so many w- news sources, and let's put air quotes around news, and you see misinformation and or disinformation propagate among them. And you hear people say, oh, well, people are saying, or oh, I've seen it in multiple places. There's a great Robert Cohn interview on YouTube, and we're not a political organization. We're a 501c3. So I'll just say some anonymous past president Uh, executed the Robert Cohn playbook to perfection in terms of making sure to hammer certain points and have them spread by lots of sources such that a large percentage of the country believed it. And it's probably been more than one president who has done that. But 
Um, it, it's a really dangerous thing when uh, the fact is that just information momentum, including disinformation momentum, just the presence of a large amount of it is enough to convince a certain pop percentage of the population that it's true. A, a very uh, clever thinker, Rene de Resta, uh, who's a very clever thinker in this space, I think coined the phrase and it, it has her kind of trademark quippiness coupled with accuracy, which is if you make it trend, you make it true. And, and that. Oh, wow, that's great. That I really mean, bad, but operate. great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about generative AI since that, that's in the news all the time these days. I remember the first example I saw well before chat GPT. Uh, the first example was the creation of an intentionally false news article about the discovery of a unicorn in a valley. I think it was in South America somewhere. And it was not intended to be any kind of malignant information, obviously. It was just a testament to the power of the uh, natural language processing engine to generate text that sounded like a news article that sounded true, but the premise was completely false. That was years ago. And even then they were worried about the impact that would have. Now we have chat GPT and anyone can log in to chat GPT and ask it to create anything they want. Do you think this generative AI is going to be a powerful new weapon in creating multiple kinds of disinformation, multiple sounding articles and blog posts and whatnot, and make it easier for one person to make it look like many people are saying this? Yeah, undoubtedly. And and I want to I want to take a moment to refer uh, the audience and also myself to a close read on a report that just came out two days ago. Uh, in collaboration, not coincidentally, by the way, with Renee DeResta, who I just quoted, um, in collaboration between her work over at the Stanford Internet Observatory and OpenAI and a number of other organizations as well. And, and the, the title is something like uh, Generative Language Models and Influence Operations, Threats and Mitigations, I think. Um, and it does a deep dive. I, because it only came out two days ago, I have only given it the most cursory glance through. So I, I, I'll refer uh, listeners to that, and I'm going to be giving it a deeper read. But to answer your question, it seems very clear to me that this style is going to generate new problems that then there there has to be a race to figure out what are what's the right cocktail of mitigations to address them. I'll note that to OpenAI's credit, they have at least declared that they are or will be putting in a watermark, a signature that makes things generated from chat GPT-3 um, trivially detectable. But that's only for them. And once a, a model that is based on the same kind of foundation model approach that right. the chat GPT-3 is based on and isn't in the hands of OpenAI, who, who I uh, currently take to be ethical and, and committed to, to kind of considering the downside, once it's in the hands of someone else, they're almost certainly not going to put a, a watermark on. And then we're going to be chasing because it's going to be very difficult to detect, I think. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about, you mentioned mitigations uh, uh, and, and that being a topic in the paper you just referenced. I'd like to get your opinion on this. What do you think are some interesting technological directions we either are taking or could take to try to combat disinformation and malinformation? Yeah, good. I mean, so, you know, the, there's various flavors of adding friction to the process of posting information. So, you know, accuracy prompts or something, um, community notes style annotation uh, are things that, that are good mitigations. Um, whether or not debunking, post hoc debunking uh, works well at scale, I think remains an open question. There's some indications that it does. There's other indications that it doesn't. I'm, I'm still a bit... Um, uh, uncertain as to its effect. But there's been some pretty solid research lately that indicates that pre-bunking is strong. Now, pre-bunking here means um, I am I have an idea about the kind of uh, disinformation that's coming. 
And before it happens, I simply frame the truthful accuracy of the situation to as wide an audience as I can in order to inoculate them from the thing that's coming, right? So that's pre-bunking. It has some limitations. You have to know what's coming. But very often, if you're paying attention, you can have a reasonable prediction of what's coming based on what groups of people in the past have done. Um, and so I think pre-bunking is a good mitigation um, oh, but certainly, you know, media literacy comes up a lot and it, it's a feel good one because we all want to ensure that we're giving great education. And certainly this problem being a global problem, we need a whole of society solution that includes industry and government and education. Education really can deliver on media literacy, but of course that presses the question, what is it that's on the curriculum of, of media literacy? And I'd pose that it needs to be about understanding the mechanics of online influence, like how, mm -hmm. how does it operate? Like how do those work um, so that you really understand it so that you can be on the lookout for it? Um, I think those are... Uh, you know, other than like kind of global things like set social norms, uh, you know, um, uh, I think those are the mitigations I'd highlight. Yeah. I like that um, some of the social media services a few years ago, or, and especially during the pandemic started to automate flagging of things. If they contained texts that could be construed as really against the accepted ground truth information that we've, you know, that either from science or from facts in other ways or things like that. Um, I, I thought that was great that they started doing that. Now, it wasn't perfect. I have a friend who had a wonderful, hilarious tweet that said, just got my second vaccine shot and my 5G reception is much better. Yeah. And he was banned from the site for a day for a joke that had a whole bunch of likes before it actually got banned. But uh, my, my real point here is there are fact checkers. There are uh, social media platforms have implemented tools to try to recognize disinformation. As powerful as GT, uh, chat GPT is, and these large language models are, do we expect a corresponding increase in the ability for automatic analysis of text an automatic comparison to facts if the text contain facts or to consensus belief and a warning that, hey, this is a, a different uh, position. It's not a mainstream belief. That doesn't mean it's wrong, but it's a, it's, a, it's a niche position on this. And there's other sources that convey the mainstream view better. Um, do, do you see any ability to, to implement tools like that? AI powered tools, because clearly no human uh, workforce could solve this with the amount of information being created. So it has to be automated. It probably has to be AI driven. Do you think AI can keep up in some way? I mean, it's going to have to, it's going to have to, and, and it's going to have to do so in a way that doesn't um, uh, force ideological hegemony, right? Like that's something yeah, you're alluding right. to there. So, right. It's one, when we talk about, this is going to seem like a detour. I hope that's okay. When we talk about, information warfare. Sometimes when we're talking about the United States versus adversaries in this regard, we sometimes talk about um, asymmetric warfare because um, uh, we have civic values and many of our allies have civic values um, around freedom of speech, for sure, um, and freedom of, of ideology, uh, a, a welcoming of a diversity of positions, and a healthy, appropriate um, resistance to creating a context where we're producing ideological hegemony. <clears throat> Certainly some, uh, imperfectly, mind you, there's nothing that any civilization does that's perfect, but, but broadly writ, those are commitments that, that we have as a polity and that our allies have as a polity. And some of our adversaries have none of those scruples at all, right? And right. so- so you have to then therefore fight in a way that's asymmetric and it's going to have to happen with the help of AI. And, and that is certainly going to mean 
identifying what are the fingerprints of um, synthetic media, whether that be uh, textual media coming from tools like GPT-3, whether that be um, image media, such as the kind of thing that might come from stable diffusion, um, uh, the deep fake video. You know, right now, that's right. the one area where the models are pretty weak. But we're going to have to, at scale, be able to rapidly identify fingerprints indicating synthetic media of all flavors. Um, certainly, we're going to need to continue to do rapid network analysis that where possible tracks back to known hostile actors, um, you know, terrorists, et cetera. Um, and those things cannot happen at a human speed. They have to happen at AI speed. And uh, it, our, our adversaries who are intent on creating um highly repressive regimes and strengthening th that hold uh, are pouring money into this problem set. So it, it is incumbent upon industry in the U.S. Uh, as well as uh, uh, in the on the U.S. government to support ways of identifying these problems at massive scale and at rapid speed. And if we don't, we're going to find ourselves in worse of a pickle than we're currently in for sure. Yeah, and, and we definitely don't want it to get any worse than it is. So let's talk about recommendations you may have. I'm going to ask you first, what is your recommendation for, you know, companies, maybe the leaders of companies, but also the employees and companies and government organizations for, for organizations and entities? What are your recommendations for them in terms of either identifying or even fighting disinformation and malinformation? Uh, you know, first embrace that this is a nuanced and complex question. Humans aren't great at embracing nuance and ambiguity sometimes. Um, so embrace uh, that it, it's a nuanced and complex uh, uh, landscape. Um, I think that uh, education, um, in the same way that we rightly learn about operational security uh, as, as part of my training for my company, I have to learn about um, our security protocols uh, around information. Um, mm -hmm. Also, of course, around, um, uh, you know, not being a perpetrator of sexual harassment, etc. That in, in the in the context of that, I think there needs to be uh, training around, well, it's media literacy, finally, and how to be alert to the spread of information, and how to detect the signals that something might be up. And, and my hunch is that one way in is to use a, an old framework, which is the old framework of rhetoric, where rhetoric means persuasion. And we think critically about logos, pathos, and ethos, where logos is the logical facts, Pathos is the emotionality and ethos has nothing to do with the ethics. It has to do with the reputation of the speaker, right? These are the three classical building blocks of persuasion. And all we're dealing with here is persuasion at massive scale. So I think that um, education and training for employees and leaders around this is important. I think that it's absolutely critical if self-service servicing in this moment to observe that companies need to hire companies like Primer. I won't make the hard pitch that we're the only one that does it, but it, it's critical that you have companies who are at least evaluating these things at scale, whoever fits you and whoever fits your need. I think it's absolutely essential. Um, I think it's important for families to talk about with their children. Uh, you know, in many ways, uh, our, our younger generations are more savvy um, th than I and others in, into the nuance. But also, it, it, it's easy for any group to, especially our youngest people, to become so enamored of frictionless um, entertainment that they lose sight of the information they're giving up. Um, and, and the information that they're consuming and what its origins might be. So I think, you know, education at home in the family is important. And, and I think there needs to be education in the schools. So technologically, we need to deliver AI that's evaluating networks and information, content, fingerprints for spread. Um, that's essential. And then as ever and always hold out the, the, the torchlight that, we, we have to wrestle this problem, and yet we remain committed to free speech, freedom of expression, freedom of ideas um, within 
you know, some legal bounds that are also appropriate and healthy. But I think if we lose sight of that principle, we lose the whole point that we're we're kind of fighting this effort for. So the, those have to be done in tandem, I think. That was a fantastic and comprehensive answer. In fact, you comprehensively answered my final question, which is what individuals and families should do about this. So thank you very much for that. Uh, love it. Want to make sure that we we close on that note because that's good recommendations for people. But Robert, I certainly hope we can bring you back on the Austin Forum upload in the future. This is not a topic people should listen to once, think, oh, that's interesting, and then ignore. This is something the Austin Forum on Technology and Society is going to revisit periodically and present thought leaders and experts and practitioners in the fight against disinformation and malinformation. And I, I hope we can get you back on the podcast or at an event uh, later in 2023. Jay, I'd be honored to be back and also to recommend other folks who I, I think are much smarter than me and can contribute as well. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the Austin Forum Upload. You can listen to additional episodes and check out a schedule of our monthly in-person events at austinforum.org. The Upload is a production of the Austin Forum on Technology and Society, a nonprofit organization here in Austin, Texas.